as we continue on in our study through the book of Genesis. Today we come to the 10th verse of Genesis chapter 3. In our previous study, we saw the fall of humanity, the fall of the human race, with the sin of Adam and, of course, the sin of Eve as well, and how they knew themselves to be naked and they tried to cover themselves, in essence, hiding from God. We, we left with that haunting passage, with God calling out to Adam and Eve, asking where they are in the garden. Of course, not because God didn't know where they were, but because he wanted to deal with their sin, and he must deal with their outright sin. We're, we're struck by the fact that God gave Adam and Eve, but let's just say Adam because it's upon his shoulders that God places the responsibility for the fall of the human race. God put upon Adam just one command, one way that he could sin, and Adam found a way to do that. So let's pick up the narrative as we continue on. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to begin now at verse 10, where we read Adam's reply to God's call out to him, where are you? Why were you hiding? Verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Notice Adam's response to the Lord there in verse 10. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Sin made Adam afraid of God's presence and afraid of God's voice. And ever since Adam, men and women, but let's just speak about humanity in general, men have run from God's presence and they don't want to listen to his word. You know, we're still made in God's image. So there's something in us that wants to be in the presence of God, that wants to hear his voice while at the same time, we're afraid of him. We're afraid of the revelation and the presence of God. You know, it strikes me that sometimes as pastors will speak to people, and I know that I've done this as a, as a, a, a preacher, I, I've asked people, giving them the opportunity that they can enter into a personal relationship with God. Now, it's really not very good phrasing, I know, because everybody has a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God. It might be a good relationship or a bad relationship, but everybody has some kind of relationship with God. But, but I think you understand what I'm getting at. You can, you can enter into this relationship of closeness and fellowship and, 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 and just a nearness to God, when actually in our fallenness, that's the last thing in the world that we want. We're grateful for God to keep his distance, thank you very much. In our fallenness, our attitude is something like, well, God, you stay where you are, and I'll stay where I am, and with never the twain shall meet. We, we run from the Lord. We, we're aware of our own sinfulness, and we like to keep a distance between ourselves and God. And that's why Adam was afraid when he heard the voice of the Lord in the garden. Now, if you notice there in verse 11, God asked Adam, who told you that you were naked? Now, God knew the answer to the question, but God asked it because he allowed Adam to make the best of a bad situation by repenting right then and there. I wonder what it would have been like, and these are just pure speculations, of course, but it's interesting to think, what would it have been like if Adam would immediately respond to the Lord, Lord, I sinned. It was all upon me. I gave in to the temptation. I knew it was wrong, and yet I did it. Father, God, would you please forgive me? It would have been very interesting to see what the outcome of things would have been if Adam would have responded that way, but he didn't respond that way. He didn't come clean. He didn't repent before God. Friends, we all sin. 
But when we sin, we can still give glory to God by openly confessing our sin without shifting the blame onto others. There's often nothing you can do about yesterday's sin. Now, I I will say, certainly in some cases, you may be able to make restitution, but assuming that there's nothing you can do about yesterday's sin, you can do what's right before God right now in this moment by confessing and repenting of your sin. Then God asked Adam, Have you eaten of the tree, from the tree, of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God confronted Adam's problem squarely. (laughs) Friends, Adam's nakedness and then the subsequent uh, apron of fig leaves, which I discussed before, I think it was the last study we did, that fig leaves are by their nature uh, sort of prickly and itchy. It would have been a very uncomfortable covering. But it wasn't primarily a wardrobe problem. It wasn't even primarily a fear problem or a self-esteem problem. Adam's problem was a sin problem. His wardrobe, his fear, his self-understanding, they could not be addressed until his sin problem was addressed. Now, In this conversation, I want you to notice that God has not included Eve directly in the conversation at all to this point. Adam was the head. He's the problem here. He's the one who's responsible. And God was dealing with him directly. Adam didn't live up to this position that God gave him as head of that, that family, head of that marriage, if you will, of Adam and Eve. Instead, verse 12, he says, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Adam's attempt to blame Eve is completely consistent with human nature. There's very few of us who are willing to simply say, as later King David did, I have sinned against the Lord. That was David's great statement of repentance in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. He, he didn't try to shift the blame. He didn't try to make excuses. He just simply said, I have sinned against the Lord. Again, I wonder what it would have been like if Adam would have said that. And again, whatever blame there is in this situation i suppose there's blame enough to go around but the blame fundamentally is on adam not eve not only did adam unjustly accuse eve but this was also a refusal to accept proper responsibility for his part in her sin now i know some of this is speculative we talked about it in our previous study that at least there's some room for speculation that that Eve's sin was due at least in part because Adam didn't properly instruct her. Adam didn't properly guide her. Adam didn't properly guard her. And again, it's easy to speculate too much on these things, but there, there, there could very well be some responsibility that Adam had for Eve's sin. But instead, he turns it around and he attempts to blame her. And If that's not bad enough, it's even worse by Adam's words in verse 12, where he said, the woman whom you, speaking to the Lord, gave me to be with me. You could say that Adam essentially blamed God for the sin. Lord, you gave me the woman and she's the problem. Adam wasn't content to only blame Eve. He also had to blame God himself like what Charles Spurgeon had to say about this. He said this, and I'm quoting here. He was guilty of unkindness to his wife and of blasphemy against his maker. In seeking to escape from confessing the sin which he had committed, it is an ill sign with men when they cannot be brought frankly to acknowledge their wrongdoing. And this was an ill sign with Adam. Now, again, I I don't want to dwell too long on this, but we are struck by the fact that Adam initially sinned, 
by knowingly, blatantly doing what God told him not to do, to take of the fruit of the tree and to eat it. But then Adam immediately added to his sin by failing to take responsibility, failing to confess his sin, blaming the woman, and even blaming, or as Spurgeon said, blaspheming God, charging him with some kind of wrong in giving the woman. We, we see how sin really is a slippery slope. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before. It's it's sort of commonly used to describe something that that starts out small but then advances. It's as if it's going down a slope and it will build momentum and get faster and become greater as it goes down. That was the characteristic of Adam's sin. He sinned first in eating the forbidden fruit, but then he added sin upon sin very quickly. Now, in verse 13, we see Eve's reply to God. Let's take a look at that verse together. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. When confronted by God, Eve didn't necessarily shift the blame when she admitted that the serpent deceived her and then she ate. This much was true. It's later on emphasized in 1 Timothy. The difference qualitatively between Adam's sin and Eve's sin. Adam sinned with his eyes wide open, but as 1 Timothy explains, Eve was deceived. It was true. She had been deceived and she did eat. But the problem comes when we see that being sin, excuse me, being deceived is at least in some sense a sin in itself. Later, the Apostle Paul would write about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, where he speaks about the sin of exchanging the truth of God for the lie. You see, for us to be successfully deceived, we need to let go of God's truth and then embrace a deception. And even while it is true in some sense we are the victims of deception, there is also some truth, at least in another sense, in which our embrace of deception is a sin all unto itself. But I would have to say, just through these first few verses, Eve comes off better than Adam in their response to the Lord. So let's take a look now, starting at verse 14 of the curse and its aftermath. God will now pronounce a series of curses, first upon the serpent, then upon Adam, and then upon Eve, or Eve and then Adam, I should say. Let's begin now with the curse upon the serpent in verses 14 and 15. We read there. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When God spoke to Adam and Eve, he questioned each of them. When God spoke to Satan, and let's be clear, it says there in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, but Satan was the being animating, or animating, I should say, animating the serpent. God didn't question Satan or the serpent because there was nothing to teach him. That's why the Lord asked questions of Adam, asked questions of Eve, was to teach. But there was nothing there to teach the serpent. And so he directly cursed the serpent, saying first, verse 14, you are cursed more than all cattle. The first part of the curse was directed at the animal that Satan used to bring the temptation. 
God commanded the serpent to slither on the ground instead of walking on legs like any other animal. Now, well, any other animal. There's some animals that don't walk on their legs, but like uh, other mammals or many reptiles. Now, let, let me be clear about this. And this is a reminder from something we've looked at before. We don't know what a serpent was like before the fall. God cursed the serpent and it transformed into something without legs, something that had to slither along the ground. Maybe it transformed in other ways as well. So the creature that tempted Eve became a serpent. And we can imagine it later after this confrontation that it slithered away as a snake. And I wonder, I, I, I don't know what that transformation looked like. Today, with modern methods of movie making and uh, CGI, computer-generated graphics and all the rest of it, it would be very interesting to, to see or to try to depict what this glorious being, or perhaps glorious, we don't know exactly what it looked like before the fall, became as it sort of transformed, as it, as it devolved. I'm not talking about evolution, I'm talking about devolution. As it devolved into becoming a serpent. I, I want to suggest to you that that must have been a terrifying thing for Adam and Eve to see. If we were to assume that in some sense, the serpent was some sort of beautiful or majestic creature before the fall, before this curse, that serpent was now transformed into the creeping, slithering, hissing snake that we know today. I wonder if Adam and Eve did not consider for a moment, it's gonna be our turn next. What's gonna to happen to us? But again, the, the core of this is found in verse 15, where it says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. There's a natural aversion between mankind and serpents. Uh, look, I, I'm not saying it's universal. Certainly, you find some people who are just unafraid, either by nature or by training, to be of serpents. But generally speaking, uh, perhaps it's a little more common among women. There's an enmity of fear between the serpent and humanity, perhaps especially the woman. But God cursed the serpent, saying, verse 14, on your belly you shall go. Whatever noble bearing the creature that now we know as the serpent had before the fall and the curse, that nobility was gone. Now the creature, Satan, used to tempt Eve, now that creature, the serpent, would be a low, groveling creature. And that's why God said to the serpent, verse 14, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, this was true of the serpent as an animal, as a reptile, but it's also true of Satan, sort of in a metaphorical sense. To eat dust has the idea of total defeat. You see that phrase used a few places in the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. The prophet Micah chapter 7, verse 17. You see, one of God's judgments on Satan is for him to always know defeat. Satan and his agents will always reach for victory, but they will always fall short of it. You know, I, I imagine, and friends, I'll, I'll admit, it's really just imagination, but I, I just imagine that w when Jesus was nailed to the cross and was in his agony and dying on the cross, I imagine that Satan, in his own thinking, he thought that he was majestic and triumph over Jesus on the cross, but he failed. In attacking Jesus, Satan made his own doom certain he would eat dust all the days of his life. And friends, this is true even in relation to the believer, those who are in Christ in regard to Satan. Remember what Romans chapter 16 verse 20 says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Again, he's low. He's in that low 
position. This was true both literally of the serpent that God cursed in the garden, but then also in a metaphorical sense of that being Satan who animated the serpent. Now, in verse 15, he's really speaking, and by he I mean the Lord, is speaking much more specifically to Satan. Again, the being that animated the serpent. When he says, and this is really the core of this whole wonderful passage here, verse 15, he'll make enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, again, this second part of the curse was not directed against that reptile that today we know as the snake or the serpent, but it was directed against Satan himself. God placed a natural animosity between Satan and mankind. That that word enmity has the idea of ill will, hatred. It's a mutual antagonism. Now, Satan's hatred of Eve was nothing new. If for no other reason, Satan hated Eve and all of mankind because they were made in God's image. And since Satan hates God, he hates that which is created in God's image. So there was already enmity on Satan's part towards humanity. But now man will, again, generally speaking have an antagonism or a fear towards Satan. You see, the the friendly conversation that Eve and the serpent seemed to enjoy earlier in the chapter, now it was finished. Now there is something of a natural fear of Satan in the heart of man. Generally, People are afraid of the demonic. They're afraid of dark powers. Even um, in tribal regions uh, where they practice animistic religions and see gods and everything, they're normally fearful and hesitant towards those gods. Friends, if we are born naturally rebellious against God, which I believe that we are, We're also born at least cautious and afraid of Satan. One must be hardened to willingly and knowingly serve Satan instinctively. We don't serve God or Satan. We serve ourselves. Now, by the way, that's just fine with the devil. (laughs) If you'll serve yourself, you're going to play into the devil's hands. In verse 15, the Lord continued on. Not only would he make this enmity between humanity and Satan, but then also verse 15, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, one of the things I like about the New King James Version, by the way, that's the Bible translation that I teach from. That's the translation that my commentary on the entire Bible is based upon, the New King James Version. I like here how in verse 15, he shall bruise your head. He is capitalized. And you shall bruise his heel. His is capitalized because that's speaking of a specific individual, the individual who shall bruise the head of Satan, and the individual who will have his heel bruised by Satan, that individual is the seed of the woman mentioned previously that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In this phrase, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, in this God prophesied the doom of Satan. He showed that the real battle was between Satan and the seed of the woman. And by the way, seed of the woman there in verse 15 is in the singular. Now, there's really no doubt that this is a prophecy of Jesus' ultimate defeat of Satan. God announced that Satan would wound the Messiah that's bruising his heel, that's a wound, but the Messiah would 
crush Satan with a mortal wound. He shall bruise your head. Now, look, I understand a, a foot injury is painful and inconvenient, but we can all agree that an injury to one's head can be mortal, where rarely would it be that an injury to a person's heel would be a mortal or a death wound. For God to announce this almost immediately after the fall in the Garden of Eden, it is as if God could not wait to announce to humanity and all the universe, God could not await to announce his plan of salvation. God's plan to bring deliverance through the one known as the seed of the woman. Think about it for a moment. If you think about a literal serpent, a snake upon the ground, the heel is that part of a human which is within the serpent's reach. And Jesus, in taking on humanity, brought himself near to Satan's domain so that Satan could strike him. It's painful to have a bruised heel. And Jesus endured the pains of humanity in coming near to us. But it was all a path to ultimate triumph to deliver the death wound to Satan to bruise his head. By the way, this prophecy also gives the first hint of what we would later call the virgin birth. I guess more technically, we should call it the virgin conception, declaring that the Messiah, the deliverer, would be the seed of the woman, but not of the man. There's no mention of Adam in this, but the seed of the woman. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 has been called the proto evangelium the first gospel. The great reformer Martin Luther said of this verse, This text embraces and comprehends within itself everything noble and gracious that is to be found anywhere in the scriptures. You could say that this was the first gospel sermon ever preached on this earth. And it was the Lord himself speaking about the humanity of the Messiah, being the seed of the woman, having his heel bruised, but then ultimately the victory of the Messiah triumphing over Satan. And for God to see the defeat of Satan at what might have been considered Satan's first flush of victory, shows that God knew what he was doing all along. Friends, I want you to understand something clearly. God's plan was not defeated. It wasn't even set back when Adam and Eve sinned. Because God's plan all along was to bring forth something greater than man in the innocence of Eden. God wanted to bring forth a creature greater than innocent man. God's plan is to bring forth redeemed man. And I'll tell you straightforwardly, the Bible tells us, in the whole of its counsel, it tells us that the glory of redeemed men and women is greater than the glory of innocent men and women. We've only known innocent man or woman very briefly in the span of the earth's history. Whatever time it was for Adam and Eve before they ate of that forbidden fruit. And I'm excluding from this, of course, the innocence of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, later. But let's just consider Adam and Eve. But God never intended that to be a long-lasting condition. God said, I'm going to bring forth something greater than innocence. I'm going to bring forth redemption. And redeemed man, this being who is greater than innocent man, is only possible because man had something to be redeemed from. The fall was a necessary step in God's great plan of the ages. Well, God didn't cause the fall, but God certainly allowed it, and God certainly knew that it would happen. 
but he was not the direct cause of Adam's sin. Adam was the direct cause of Adam's sin. But it could not have happened without God's sovereign plan working out because of God's great goal to bring forth something greater than innocent man. We, we err greatly when we think that God's goal is to bring us back to the innocence of Eden. Friends, God's goal is to take us to a place greater than Eden. The new Jerusalem is greater than the Garden of Eden. Redeemed man is greater than innocent man. Or to put it this way, we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. And for all that, in some way or another, the fall was a necessity and it didn't set back God's plan at all. The curse upon the serpent and Satan, that being that animated the serpent, demonstrates this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Now, let's take a look at verse 16, where it says, God's now going to address Eve, the woman. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. In verse 16, God pronounced a curse upon a woman, and he began with cursing the woman with multiplied sorrow. I'll multiply your sorrow and your conception. You'll bring forth children in pain. And then the, the marital dynamic that's described later in the chapter. Men and women have each known sorrow throughout history. Yet the unique sorrow of women is well known. You could say that throughout the course of history, women have had to endure more sorrow than men. Truly, that curse has worked its way out through history. I will greatly multiply your sorrow. Now, certainly under Jesus, some of the effects of the curse are relieved now for believers. Now, they'll only ultimately be relieved. That the curse will only ultimately be done away with in God's new heavens and new earth, in the world to come. But, but certainly God addresses some of the effects of the curse among his people now. And it has been certainly the Christianizing of society that brought rights and dignity to women. Donald Gray Barnhouse, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, said this. I'm going to read a quote from him here. He said, It is difficult for women in Christian lands to realize the miseries of their hundreds of millions of sisters in pagan lands, where the lot of women is little above that of cattle. Where the gospel has gone, the load has been lifted, and the woman in Christ has become the reflection of the redeemed church, the bride of Christ. I think that's a good word from Donald Gray Barnhouse in his commentary. So, this sorrow would be multiplied, and then he continues on in verse 16, Your sorrow and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. This first curse upon the woman was a broad one. It had the idea that women would experience pain in regard to their children in general, not only in the act of giving birth, which, of course, we know is a painful process, physically speaking, but that there would be pain associated with children, for a woman especially, throughout her life. Look, I, I don't know if I agree with the, with the sentiment of this statement, but there's something to it where people say that a mother is only as happy as her most miserable child. 
there's a sense in which that maternal love and instinct experiences pain not only sometimes in the difficult relationship that there may be between a mother and her children but in the misery of the children themselves now of course there is a aspect a role of this that the father plays as well they're, they're not immune to this but we would say it is in general especially acute among mothers among women you could say that God ordained that the pain with which women bring children into this world would be an example of the pain that they more generally experience in life. I've read, friends, I'm not a botanist, I'm not a zoologist, I, I don't really know, but I've read that human beings, human women, bring forth children with more pain than just about any other creature in God's animal kingdom. Again, I, I don't know that for sure, but it would be interesting if, if true. Verse 16, the curse on the woman continues. God said to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband. Now, again, speaking in generalities, because when we're speaking about things as massive as all women and all men, all we can do is speak in generalities. But in general, this is true of women in a way that is not true for men. Donald Gray Barnhouse, again, in his commentary, explained it this way. He said, this verse will be understood better when it is realized that the desire of man towards his wife alone is solely by God's grace and not by nature. There is, again, speaking generally, a longing in women for marital relationship in all of its aspects that a husband may or may not share or he needs to learn and have God's grace work in him. Again, I, I almost apologize for giving so many caveats to this. I'm speaking in generalities. But in generalities, I think this sees to be true. As it continues there in verse 16, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. The, the idea was to contrast the woman's desire and the husband's rule over her. I believe this speaks of an inherent challenge that the woman, or you could say that the wife, faces in embracing the husband's role as leader of the home and the family. That same word for desire is also used in the next chapter of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, of the desire of sin to master over Cain. It certainly can have the aspect of a desire for mastery, a desire to rule over. And I wouldn't say that that word is translated in that sense in every instance. But to me, it seems to fit contextually here. Because of the curse, Eve would have to fight a desire to master over her husband. A desire that works against God's ordained order for the home. And if I could, we talked about this in a previous study, but I think it's worth it without going through the full explanation just to bring up the point. This order that God established in the home, Adam's headship, it was established before the fall. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and chapter 2, verse 22 are examples of this. But now, under the curse, it makes that headship much more problematic. B because of the curse, Eve will find it more difficult for her to submit unto and flow with God's institution of the husband's headship in the home. Because of the fall, Adam will not be the leader that he should be. And that in and of itself will make it more problematic for Eve to properly receive her husband's role as head of the home, 
Again, as the Lord stated it, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, continuing on to verses 17 through 19, we're now in the most extended passage here. God places the curse upon the man, upon Adam. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. If you notice, God sort of prefaced the formal curse aspect of this by telling Adam, it was because you have heeded the voice of your wife. It wasn't just that Adam took Eve's advice. He chose to disobey God at the suggestion or the invitation of his wife. He chose to be with Eve instead of obeying God. It may be that there was some sense of an idolatry of Eve was an aspect of Adam's disobedience against God. Adam, if your wife wanted to entice you to do something wrong, you should not have done it. It doesn't escape any of your responsibility. And because of this, God began to pronounce this curse upon Adam, and you would say his descendants as well. There is a sense, and we need to be aware of this, in which every man is a son of Adam. Every woman is a daughter of Eve. He says here in verse 17, God said, Cursed is the ground because of you. Because of Adam, there was a curse put upon all creation. Before the curse on humanity The ground only produced good, but after the curse, it still produced good, but also, as verse 18 says, thorns and thistles, they would come faster, and they would come easier than good fruit. Friends, in your back garden of your house, if you do have one, you you have no difficulty growing weeds and problem plants. They grow quite well on their own, don't they? But to bring forth good fruit, nourishing fruit, the plants that you want, that takes care, that takes effort, that takes concern. The curse God placed upon Adam and humanity promised, as it says in verse 18, thorns and thistles. We remember that Jesus was crowned with thorns. That's in Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. And in this vivid way, Jesus Christ bore the curse for us. Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England, spoke eloquently on this. So let me read you him a quote from this. He said, quote, The curse of the earth was on his head and wounded him full sore. Was he crowned with thorns? And do you wonder that they grow up all around your feet? Rather, bless him that he ever should have consecrated the thorn by wearing them for his diadem, for his crown. So even though the ground would be cursed, God said to Adam in verse 17, in toil you shall eat of it. See, Adam worked before the curse. Um, Work itself is not an effect of the fall. But Adam's work before the curse was all joy. Now work would have a cursed element to it, with pain and weariness as a part of work. I'm reminded of the words of the book of Job, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. I think this speaks eloquent of the weariness of work. This is what it says, Job, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Is there not a time of hard service for man on the earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade 
and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages. There is an inherent frustration, dissatisfaction with work. Now, I, I think in terms of myself, I, I love my job. I'm very blessed by the work that I get to do. Yet there's still days when I don't want to do my work. There's still days when even the blessed work that I have feels at least something like a curse. But God continued in this curse upon Adam and his descendants. Verse 19, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The final curse upon man promised that there would be an end of his toil, an end of his labor on the earth, but it would be the end of death, not an end of deliverance. The curse of death shows that the result of Adam's sin extended to the entire human race. Because of Adam, sin entered the world. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us that. Because of Adam's sin, death came to all mankind. Romans chapter 5 verse 15 tells us that. Also 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. Because of Adam's sin, death reigned over man and even all creation. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 tells us that. Because of Adam's sin, all men were condemned. And I use men there in the sense of humanity. We're all condemned to die. That's in verse 18 of Romans chapter 5. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 19 tells us that because of Adam's sin, all humanity was made sinners. Now, in Paul's letter to the churches of the region of Galatia, he said something remarkable in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. He said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. Now that principle of Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 is established as we consider that Jesus Christ bore each aspect of the curse upon Adam and Eve in its totality. Again, he became a curse for us. Now, Paul means that, I think, primarily in the sense receiving the curses that were required under the law of Moses, but it also encompasses the curses on all humanity experienced by Adam and Eve and all their descendants declared to us here in Genesis chapter 3. You see, if we think of each aspect of the curse and how it might apply to Jesus, we see that sin brought pain to childbirth. And no one knew more pain than Jesus when he, through his suffering, brought many sons to glory. He was a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. Sin brought conflict, and Jesus endured great conflict to bring forth our salvation. Thorns came with sin and the fall, and Jesus endured a crown of thorns to bring our salvation. Sin brought sweat, and Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood to win our salvation. Sin brought sorrow, and Jesus became a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief, to save us. And sin brought death, and Jesus tasted death for everyone that we might be saved. Friends, we look at this tremendous curse that God placed on humanity, that its effects are still present in every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve. But we rejoice that we have a Savior who came and submitted himself to this curse, that he might lift his children, his followers, his disciples above that curse. Continuing on here in Genesis chapter 3, let's take a look at verse 20, where Adam names Eve. We read here, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. 
up to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, the woman had never been called Eve. We're so used to saying Adam and Eve that we assume that she already had her name. But to this point, she was called a female. That's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. A helper, indeed a helper comparable in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. A, a woman in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. And she was called a wife in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, 25, and chapter 3, verse 8. Now, this doesn't mean that God didn't have a name for Eve, but we're told what the name is in Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. He called them mankind. And it's interesting. This seeing that God looked at all of humanity, all of humanity at that point was two people, and called them mankind, I think it's connected to an idea that we continue, or at least much of the world continues, the Western world, it's not universal and it's even being diminished in its application, but the idea that the woman takes her name from the husband in marriage. That's connected back to the idea in Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, he called them mankind. The idea that both genders can be encompassed in terms like mankind, humanity, and chairman. Now, I don't think that our use of these terms is merely cultural. It's biblical. There is some sense, and again, this isn't universal, but it's generally true that a woman gains more of her identity from her husband, from the man, than the man does from the wife. It's important. It's important for a woman to take care in what kind of man that she marries. You're going to bear his name. Again, I think at some point that's, that's a concept that's consistent biblically. Take care in what name you'll take. Verse 12, or excuse me, verse 20, it says that he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. Adam named her Eve even though she was not a mother at the time. She was not even pregnant. Yet Adam named her in faith, trusting that God would bring forth a deliverer from the woman because God said that he would defeat Satan through the seed of the woman. Remember back at verse 15, God said that there would be a descendant, a seed of the woman, and Adam knew intuitively that she would be the mother of all living. Verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God wanted Adam and Eve to be clothed, not naked. If nudity represented a higher, freer life, then God would have let Adam and Eve remain naked, but he clothed them. But he didn't want them to be clothed in the fig leaves that they made themselves. Those were insufficient and probably uncomfortable coverings. So what did God do? Verse 21 tells us that God made them tunics of skin. In order for Adam and Eve to be clothed, a sacrifice had to be made. An animal had to die. Remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. An animal had to die to provide them with the garments. And friends, I would just simply say that God sacrificed the animal. It says very plainly that God clothed them in skins. He provided a covering for Adam and Eve that came from sacrifice. And this obviously points forward to the perfect sacrifice that God himself would make in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It could be said that there are only two religions. There's the religion of fig leaves, and there's the religion of 
of God's perfect provision through Jesus Christ. Covering ourselves with our good works is like Adam and Eve trying to cover themselves with fig leaves. Our good works are like pretend money. They're great for games you might play, but you can't actually buy anything with it. Your good works are essential for what it takes for you to live out a godly life. But you can't purchase your salvation with them. No, there's the religion of fig leaves, and then there's the religion of God's perfect provision through Jesus Christ. Adam and Eve were clothed with a garment that was purchased with the life of another. We are clothed with a garment of righteousness, and by we, I mean those who are disciples of Jesus, God's people, his followers, they are clothed with a garment of righteousness that was purchased with the life of another. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. Friends, I believe that this, together with the expression of faith that Adam and Eve had in God's promise, indicated in the naming of Eve, I think that this shows us that Adam and Eve were rescued from their sinful condition, covered by sacrifice. Adam had faith in God's promise of a Savior. Eve did as well. And God provided a covering for them through sacrifice. Friends, I I really don't have any doubt you're going to see Adam and Eve in heaven. Now let's take a look at this last bit of the chapter here, starting at verse 22, where we read, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now he has put out his hand and to take out also of the tree of life and eat forever, or lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, lest he live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God here speaking among the Godhead once again. He says, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. I have to admit, I find this phrase a little difficult to understand. Some people have suggested that there's a note of sarcasm that God would use here. I find that a little bit unlikely, but I suppose it's a possibility. Sarcasm regarding Satan's empty promise that they would become like gods. Oh, you become like one of us. You've fallen. You know evil. You think you're like one of us. Maybe there's a note of sarcasm there. Or perhaps the idea focused on man's greater knowledge, even though it was knowledge in a bad sense, now that he had an experiential knowledge of evil. But because of this concern that man was now fallen, in verse 22, God says that he was concerned that man would also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Friends, in mercy... God protected Adam and Eve from the horrible fate of having to live forever as sinners. He prevented them from eating from the tree of life. Friends, an eternal, unredeemed existence would be more like hell than heaven. And God wanted to spare Adam and Eve that. So what did they do? Verse 23 Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Verse 23 says, The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden. I've wondered sometimes, did Adam and Eve want to stay in the Garden of Eden? Perhaps they felt that if they left the Garden, they might never see God again. That's where God met with them. Perhaps they enjoyed it as a comfortable place. I, I don't know. I don't know if they wanted to stay, if they wanted to leave, but they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And verse 24 says that God placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, uh, 
the entrance to the garden was on the east. And a flaming sword was held, presumably in the hand of a cherubim, to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, I find it fascinating that in the Bible, cherubim are always associated with the presence and the glory of God. You could look it up in Ezekiel chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, cherubim are not sort of in that medieval conception, you know, the fat little baby with wings. No, they're fearsome, awesome creatures associated with the very throne of God. And when cherubim were represented on earth, such as in the tabernacle, they marked a meeting place with God. All of this is very suggestive to me. Even though Adam and Eve and their descendants were prevented from eating the fruit of the tree of life, and that was God's mercy to them, they could still come there to meet God. I believe that the cherubim were there, literally, look at verse 24 again, to guard the way to the tree of life, to make access to the tree of life possible so that men could meet with God and probably sacrifice to him there. And the cherubim guarded access there. Now, of course, humanity could not stay in the tree of life, nor could they eat of the tree of life. But there may have been a meeting place with God established. Again, I've been quoting Barnhouse a lot. Let me read you one more quote from him. His commentary, he writes this, Any angel of the lowest rank could have dealt with Adam. The flaming sword was pointed against Satan to keep him from destroying the way of access to the altar, which God has set up. So it's fascinating to think that the cherubim were not there to prevent Adam and Eve from coming to this place God had established as a meeting place, but actually to preserve that access. Now, friends, this is the last historical mention of the Garden of Eden in the Bible. We can speculate that God did not destroy the Garden of Eden, but he left it to the effects of the curse and suppose that it generally deteriorated from its original condition, blending into the surrounding geography and then being somewhat erased at the flood, global flood, that later happens in the book of Genesis. We're going to leave it off here for the day, but before we leave, let's examine a couple ways that Genesis chapter 3 verses 10 through 24 points to Jesus. Now, of course, we've discussed, haven't we, how how could you miss it? In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. It's all about him. It's all about his great victory over Satan. He is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. He is the one whose heel was bruised by the serpent. He is the seed of the woman, the great deliverer for all of humanity. That's obvious. We also see that Jesus is the one who bore the curse and all the different ways that the curse was put upon Eve first and then Adam, Jesus bore that curse. We saw that. Let me suggest to you two additional ways. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Even as God sacrificed an animal to make coverings for Adam and Eve, so Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. And then finally, number four, I mean, Number one, Jesus is the seed of the woman, the fulfillment of this great prophecy. Uh, Number two, Jesus bore the curse. Number three, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Number four, and finally, Jesus is the gatekeeper to the garden of God. When Jesus promised the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23 that that thief would be with Jesus in paradise, Jesus used a word that essentially means garden. That's what paradise means. That's its root. It's the same word used in the ancient Greek Bible, we call it the Septuagint, to describe the Garden of Eden. Jesus is the one who brings God's people back to God's garden. That garden is no longer on earth, but it's in heaven. 
And Jesus Christ working in and through his people brings us back there, as I said before, in a state greater than Adam in his innocence. By the wonderful grace of God, we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper to the garden of God. You must come through him. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus Christ is the great deliverer for humanity, the seed of the woman promised way back in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your great plan. Thank you for its perfection in Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus bore the curse on behalf of his people. We thank you, Lord God, that Jesus Christ is our gatekeeper to your garden. And we trust in him to guard our way and to guide us to paradise, to God's garden, to heaven, your ultimate culmination of your restoration of all things on earth as well as in heaven. We thank you for your greatness, your goodness, and your grace, even as we see it in this section that observes the fall of humanity. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.